Hey, it's Les from the TV Dudes. This week, I chat with actor Mark McKinnon about his roles on The Blacklist, Gotham, and Veep, as well as the BET Her film, The Waiting Room. We discuss his charity work as well, and what he wants young actors to know about the business. It's a great interview, and I hope you enjoy. Hey, Mark. Thank you so much for making time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be on your show. So uh, you are going to, you're going set to play a lead role in an upcoming BET Her film, The Waiting Room. Um, for folks that don't know, BET Her uh, is a new initiative from BET of female-centric original short films. Uh, the one that you're in is directed by Cheryl Lee Ralph. They've also got Kim Fields is going to direct one, uh, Vanessa Bell Calloway, uh, Victoria Rowell. It, it, just a great it's just a great idea. I'm, I'm so glad that's happening. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your role in the waiting room, uh, auditioning, getting involved with the project? I know it's uh, it's something that's that's close to your heart uh, personally, just the subject matter. Can you talk a little bit about the the project? Yeah, absolutely. It all started with, uh, as you mentioned, uh, four short films that BET were doing to talk about first mental health and then breast cancer. Uh, the two mental health films I was able to be casting director for, I cast those two films. Um, and that's what led me to being in the conversations when the casting director for Like, Comment, Subscribe was looking for a lead actor. My name came in the conversation. So when they sent me the script, the first thing that I fell in love with was the love story. I love a really good love story, especially a strong black love story. And I saw that in the script. But as I continued to read and I really, really started to understand the message that BET and BET Her was trying to do, that's when I realized that this is really a strong and powerful message about breast cancer and the awareness that we need to put in our community. And that's what I want my career to be about. I want it to be about something that's not just entertainment, but something that's going to make an impact. And they did a great job with this initiative to bring light to breast cancer and making sure that we understand how it affects the black community and our families. Yeah, that's great. It's something I've been, I'm sure everybody's been thinking about a little bit more this past year. What, what responsibility narratives have not necessarily to to lecture at folks but mm -hmm. but to reflect stories that 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 show you how to a, a certain way that that problem might be dealt with or at least see somebody wrestle yeah. with what you're wrestling with absolutely and and they did it in a short film format so it's, it's a quick hitter, something that you get right to the point right away. Both films are 20 minutes long. Or actually, all four films are 20 minutes long. And, you know, so you get right to the message, and it's very strong, and, and you leave there right away knowing and inspired to want to do more. I was able to go see uh, the two films last night. They had a pre-screening at RFK Stadium in D.C., and you felt the energy. You felt the emotion. You felt the need to go take care of our health and make it more um, important to us. That's great. In terms of that feeling that that I don't know, any good acting perform any any good theater or uh, whether it's on television or, or on stage that energy that that can just happen of, of dropping you into someone mm -hmm. else's story or into this fantasy narrative uh, can you talk a little bit about discovering that for yourself I know uh, you switched kind of interests over from football to, to acting can you talk a little bit about when the when the bug bit you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was a high school football player and basketball player. I uh, was captain of my football team and captain of the basketball team, won MVP and everything. So everything was going great. I was looking forward to go play football in college. But one of the things I knew was that I wanted to be uh, an actor. I realized that because in high school, I made a big effect on our black community because there wasn't too many black, uh, black in our plays and productions, especially males. And so when a lot of my friends and, and uh, uh, teammates saw me in the play that following year, so many blacks came out to audition for the plays and were a part of the production. So when I saw that impact, I said, you know what, this is what I want to do. This is the impact I want to make. 
So when I was going to different schools to visit, to go to different colleges, a lot of the schools that offered me scholarships, a lot of times they didn't have the theater program that I wanted to be a part of, whether it was because it was, it was too strong into the classical or I didn't realize that they were doing the type of shows that I wanted to be a part of. I decided to go to Howard University, uh, ended up walking onto the football team, and um, I had to audition to get into the theater arts program. When I walked into that audition, they told me, they was like, Mark, we already know that you're a football player, but you do know that for you to audition for our program, you have to give up football. And I laughed at them like, I'm going to do both. And it was like, we don't have athletes a part of our program because the schedules don't work. And I was like, I'm going to be the first. They was like, well, then you can't audition. And I was like, I made it this far because it's very hard to even get an audition for the arts program. So I went in an audition. I told them, you know what, I'm not going to play football. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, you know what, I am going to play football. You know, so I ended up um, auditioning. They ended up uh, offering me to be a part of the program. I ended up walking into the football team. And maybe like three weeks in, you know, we have a 5 a.m. practice for the football team. And the practice was not good. We was not having a good practice. So what did the coach do? I'm going to see y'all later on tonight at 6 o'clock. And guess what I also had scheduled at 6 o'clock that night? A rehearsal for a play I was in in my program. And so that was the first time I felt that friction where I realized I had to make a decision. And I, I decided, and it wasn't easy, but I made a tough decision. Well, you know what? I, I, I'm here in school to study acting. This is what I want to do. I'm already enjoying the program they're doing. And then when you're a freshman on the football team, it could be another two or three years before you see playing time. You know, so I realized, you know what, this may be that season, that time. Uh, which is why one of my dream roles as an actor would be to be in an athletic movie, you know, something like a Friday Night Light. So to yeah. remember the Titans, you know, I would love something like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, uh, that experience, both uh, doing stuff like being a casting director on on projects now, but also that that feeling of, of seeing that, hey, now that now that my friends and peers have seen me in a play, they know that it, that maybe it's okay for them to audition for the play. Did did that help uh, inform your decision to to start up your own acting studio after graduation from Howard? That that ability uh, to kind little, of help folks it, figure it out. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because even before I decided to uh, start my acting studio, I was already doing it. I was already giving advice to actors already giving them, uh, helping them get agents, already helping them get these auditions. I was just doing it out of the goodness of my heart and just the passion for wanting to see actors win. Another reason behind me starting the actor studio, I saw how much bad business was out here, how many times actors got screwed over, or the programs that make you spend so much money and they mm-hmm. say they can make you a star and they make you pay all these monthly fees. And that really inspired me to help people navigate away from that. Yeah. And so that's what the studio I started with was that, you know, and that's why we, you know, uh, you know, we see some of the, the actors right here in the Maryland area. You see them on major shows in New York and L.A., even in Atlanta, because we really created this program, this system to help them navigate through the junk and get straight to the point of what you need to do to be in a position to book acting jobs and get representation. That's great. Uh, in terms of, of developing your own career, uh, have you had any things that, have you had any turning point moments where you thought, yes, I've been making the right choices. This is, this is what I should be continuing to do. Any, any good advice of, of recognizing when you, when you were on the right track? Um, for me was, so when I first graduated uh, from college, you know, I was a heavy theater actor, you know, and when you go to college, you learn heavy, you learn so much craft, 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 craft. You don't learn too much about the business. So my first year in New York, Everyone kept telling me, Mark, too much, too big. Mark, too much, too big. You know, I'm coming out there like, what do you mean? I was there. I was committed. I was, I was in it. I felt it. I'm sweating. And they kept telling me, too much, too much, too big, right? And so one day, I came across this YouTube video called Michael Caine Acting in Film. Classic video. And this was the first time I've ever saw someone talk about what you need to do to make acting work on camera. Mm. And I was drawn to it in the first 10 minutes. The first 10 minutes right away made me realize everything I've been doing for the last year in New York has been wrong. Not bad, but the wrong direction. And that's why it's so important that actors take on-camera acting techniques if you are going to do film and TV. Theater background is great. I highly recommend that as well. But if you're going to be going to these on-camera auditions, if you're going to be acting on film, it's a different skill and level that you've got to grasp in order to really navigate between both. And that's when I felt like I was going in the right direction when I started taking those on-camera classes that made my work work for the camera. Yeah, that makes sense. That I mean, if, if you're playing for a back row, but but really you're under a microscope, you're just going to look insane. 
and that yeah exactly and you know there's cast conductor rooms and you know in new york and they're, they're super small you know you're almost in somebody's closet and you're in there doing theater technique trying to reach the back of the audience i can now i laugh at myself now it's like i probably was way too busy <laughs> like yelling and everything <laughs> you know that's great um in terms of uh when, when you were looking at the folks at Howard and saying, no, 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 it'll be fine. Uh, I, I'll, I'll do both practices. Nobody will ever move their schedules. I'm just going to do both. Uh, what mm-hmm. what do you hear back when you're giving folks advice about on-camera acting or, or about the biz? Uh, where, where, oh, the, you know, I know they're going to push back. Just, oh, well, you're not going to believe me on this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. You, I'm sorry, can you repeat that I'm question? I'm sorry, do you... Do you have folks come back with you with like, no, no, I'm I'm going to do all three of these projects and it'll be fine. What what do you feel like is the common thing you hear back from younger actors uh, where they're arguing with you of, no, I, I know better. I can make it work. Oh, quitting their jobs. Oh, man. So many of my clients, they booked their first, you know, quote unquote, high paying job, you know, high paying job when you start out as an actor. And then you get that four digit check and it's like a thousand dollars or even if you get like a seven hundred dollar gig. <laughs> Mm-hmm. People like, you know what? Oh, I'm making nine times what I would in, on a regular job. And I even made that mistake. I remember when I, I had quit my full-time job and I got my first agent. And I had made three back-to-back jobs. I made $3,000 each, each of those uh, uh, jobs. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, why do I need to work? I made $3,000 per day. But what I didn't realize by the end of the year, I only made $9,000. <laughs> yeah. I left a job making way more to realize by the end of the year, this doesn't add up. One of the biggest things that I always try to encourage my clients and, my, and actors everywhere is like, you got to work your dream and your job until your dream becomes your job. You know, you got to not look at your job as, oh, this is plan B just in case plan A fails, because that means you're dialing plan A. You got to look at your plan B as a supplement for plan A. Yeah. This is how I'm funding what I'm trying to do. Because if you can't afford headshots, if your agent needs you to get a new headshot, well, why am I doing it? If you can't afford acting classes and you need to be training consistently, what are you doing to grow? You know, and I was that actor. So that's the biggest thing that I feel like I'm always getting pushed back on when people, they, you know, cause we, we want to quit our job. We want to focus on acting. <laughs> right. But then the moment you do that, you know, you're going to learn real, and, and you don't have, you're not a full time actor until you have a contract that makes you full time. Until then you're just an auditioning actor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And auditioning doesn't pay. That you don't well. get to audition <laughs> at all. Yeah. At all. And if anything, you got to pay money to audition, you know, especially for, you know, myself and clients who we go back and forth between Maryland and New York. Right. You know, you got to pay to get on that train and the buses, you know, some people flying down to Atlanta. That, that, that stuff adds up. Uh, yeah, it adds up. Yeah. I was, I was just talking to a friend of mine that had, had left a full time job to, to work on a uh, side hustle and it, it almost broke that line of, of working, but he ended up having to go back to the full time job. And it was, thank, you know, it was still mm-hmm. there for him, thankfully. I, but but I could hear it in his voice feeling like, ah, oh, this is a failure. I got to go back. I was like, man, that don't look at it like that. The thing you're going back to is a tool to make this other thing work. You you can do, mm-hmm. can do both. You're not picking one. The other, you know, the entrepreneurial, you didn't die. We, we didn't bury him. You know, this is right. this is a this grind job is a steady paycheck that will that will pay for. Like you said, if, if headshots are your thing you need or acting classes, do both hustle. Uh, but it's yeah. so, it's so tempting to, yeah. to scream. I made it <laughs> and jump on the boss's desk oh, and walk cool out. Time. Exactly. You'd be ready to do it. And like I said, I made that mistake and I learned very quickly, like, Oh yeah, I still need to work. Cause I was that sovereign artist, you know, that I was that guy that was sleeping on couches and using friends, cars and asking moms for money. And here I am in my twenties still doing that. And I realized I was like, you know what? Something, ha- something has to change. And the moment it changed for me, honestly, was when um, my father passed away. Um, my father wasn't in my life, um, so I hadn't seen him for like 20 years. And then out of nowhere, I got a random call from a cousin that I didn't even know was my cousin saying, your father passed away. Um, and I'm in Maryland, and I found out he was in Orlando, Florida. And what really woke me up was the fact that I could not afford to get to Florida to see my dad one last time. I couldn't. Thank God for my church, uh, City of Praise Family Ministry. They ended up sponsoring me going down there to be able to uh, go see my father. So when that plane ride down there was when I realized, you know what, something has to change. Like, you know, something has to give. I have to do something different. And then, you know, us as artists, we, we, we still fight against it. Even though my mind was telling me that and my heart was telling me that, that, that artist in me was still like, no, you're going to figure it out. You're going to figure it out. 
And I'll never forget, right after that funeral, maybe like a month later, I had booked this job. And it was paying, you know, pretty, pretty good. And I still wasn't happy. I got that check, and I still was not happy. And I was like, something's wrong. How, do I, how, how am I getting this check, and I'm not happy? I'm doing what I supposedly love, and mm-hmm. I'm getting paid to do it, and I'm still not happy. Something is wrong. That's when I realized because my life was not balanced. Financially, I didn't have it all together. Financially, I wasn't spending time with family. So that's something I'm always encouraging active as well. So make sure you have a balanced life because now you're not going into auditions thirsty and going for the job for the money, but you're going in there like you're either going to like me or you're not. If not, I'm on to the next one, you know, and it just changes how you enter the room. It changes how you prepare because now it's about the craft and not about the money. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I feel like we hear a lot that, that oh, you, you need that that hunger that comes from being just, just dead broke and skint and – I think a lot of times people don't talk about what that stress does to you overall and how that affects mm-hmm. your decisions mm-hmm. and your uh, patience and what you feel like you can wait for and uh, and just your sleep and your energy. Yeah, it, it takes a lot. It takes a whole talk in the body on, on your mental capacity. You know, depression and stress is, is real. I, I know friends and family that's dealing with it heavy and it's not fun to watch somebody go through it. You know, and so, yeah, to, to, to put yourself in a position where, you know, you're forcing yourself to go that direction is, is a very tough thing to do, you know. So that's why I'm always encouraging people to make sure you aim for a balanced life. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's uh, funny you bring up mental health and uh, brings it right back around to the to the short films. Uh, I'm so glad that these mm-hmm. are topics that are being brought up this year. I, we keep everybody sees memes go around saying, hey, check on your friends. You know, everybody's stuck in their homes and not everybody's doing OK. But mm-hmm. it's it's not mm-hmm. just a meme; it's real. Uh, and I'm glad that we're discussing mental health now because this has been a problem for years of us not discussing what to do about it if you're having problems. But it's getting real now. Mm-hmm. Everybody's this pandemic kind of brought it to a head. Yes, uh, yes. As far as uh, folks seeing the films at home, and and you not just as an actor, but being involved casting the whole things, having a hand in them. What are you hoping folks at home? kind of take away from it or, or conversation starters? Well, number one thing is we can, we have to stop waiting until it's too late to get a checkup. And that's what's happening uh, with our community is that we wait to the very last minute to get it. So by the time you go get diagnosed or go hear what, what's going on with you, you have a stronger fight. You know, so the, the, the point of these films was to encourage people to go get checked daily, get checked regularly, even if nothing feels like it's going wrong still get that checkup just in case because the earlier you can get that you know know what you're dealing with that that it makes the fight easier and i'm not saying easy but easier you know it's always going to be a fight but when you take a step ahead of the game trust me you have better um and even more options to uh succeed you know and i know people who have done that they got checked regularly and daily and they overcame whether it was cancer whether it was depression or mental health anything they were able to overcome it because they got to step ahead of the game early and have the right medications or uh, systems in place to uh, heal from it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I have been to therapy for depression and I'm on meds and, and the med I'm on existed when I was in college, but I didn't go ask for help. Wow. And I, I don't know why I mm. looking back on it now, the, the, how difficult college was for me. It shouldn't have, it didn't need to be that hard. Uh, I, wow. but, but I didn't know how to ask for help then. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, uh, my, my father's living with cancer now, but he ignored, he, he's having a, he had a much harder road with it, uh, because he ignored it for two years. And so today, actually, wow. I, I scheduled, uh, the, it's the first of a series of consultations to get a colonoscopy screening, but, uh, you know, it's not the, yeah, okay, not okay. the most fun thing to talk, but, it, but it's real. I, I'm, I'm right, in my forties right. and my father real. has yeah. colon cancer, so I've got to get checked. Because if wow. they catch it early, yeah. like you said, the options available to you are way different than if they catch it late. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and being able you to know. talk about this, I'm glad to see this stuff on my TV. Uh, it, it helps normalize conversations. If, and, and that, to me, is the thing that, that really needs to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, my father, he died of prostate cancer, my grandmother breast cancer. You know, so cancer, you know, is, is in my family, you know, so... That's why I was encouraged to be a part of something like this. And I've learned a lot in this process. Yeah. And I've even take, uh, taken it a step further where I teamed up with uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Health to really push this message, you know, because um, they got four guidelines in place to really help people reduce the risk of cancer. Uh, you know, and that's how passionate I am about really helping people 
uh, make the right decision and to take their health serious. That's wonderful, man. I, it's so great to get to talk to you about all this. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to see the waiting room uh, and the rest of the, the shorts. Uh, oh. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You. Have a great rest of your day, man. I appreciate you. You too. Awesome. TV Dudes is an independently run podcast out of Austin, Texas. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is done by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to the TV Dudes.com. I'm Randy Lander. I'm Les Weiler. And I'm Kyle Scott. Thanks for listening.